Welcome to Northwest Profiles, a look at people, places, and events of interest in the inland Northwest. The sights and sounds of modern miracles. Human life so fragile and vulnerable, getting the help it needs to grow strong and survive. Sometimes it takes drugs and surgery. Other times it just takes time. And breath by breath, Forest Bird's inventions give these babies time. The ventilator basically is working to fill the baby's lungs with oxygen or air mixture um, and exhale for the baby when the lungs are too immature, too premature to function normally without support. Ventilate is basically like blowing up a balloon. You blow and then you let out. You blow and you let out. Before the advent of the baby bird ventilator for newborn care, by and large, very, very few of the smaller prematures, uh, babies less than even four and a half or five pounds, babies that are considered big by today's standards, uh, about 95% of those babies would, would die if they needed other than just what was available at the time was an isolate full of oxygen. These days, as opposed to that kind of uh, tremendous mortality rate, probably 95%, uh, 90 to 95% of all of these premature babies will survive, and most of those will do well. Remember, this was the heart pump, yeah. In his lab overlooking Lake Ponderé, Dr. Forrest Bird continues his work designing and manufacturing medical respirators. With his wife, Dominique, he evaluates a prototype of a new generation of respirator, capable of gently delivering 1,000 tiny breaths of oxygen a minute to fragile lungs. It is another landmark in a field Dr. Bird has led for over 40 years, since his invention of a respirator called the Mark 7. And that was probably the first mass-produced clinical respirator that could be used on the smallest neonate or the largest adult. And, of course, they started to get around the hospitals throughout the world, and they are literally everywhere in the world, depending, uh, regardless of political alignment. And they were the Model T Ford of all respirators, and they're still out there today, and we made hundreds of thousands of them. In fact, they're still in production, uh, an updated model of it. But interestingly enough, the first Mark 7 out there could be updated to new, it probably will never wear out. And this course started me deeper and deeper, and one road led to the other, and we made the universal respirator. But then we started to look further at, gosh, you'd watch a patient, no matter what you did, you'd lose the patient. And you'd sit there, well, gee, if I had my druthers and I only had this or I only had that, maybe the patient would have survived. And that was the challenge, I guess, that made me really delve into what might be called uh, biomedical technology, not from an engineering point, but from a conceptual point. In other words, could you take and devise equipment utilizing physics and physiology and so on that were compatible with? In other words, don't force the patient to comply with the respirator, but you actually develop a device that will take and breathe with the patient. Yeah. Dr. Bird lived in Palm Springs prior to moving his company to North Idaho in the late 60s. Here he has virtually complete control over the manufacturing of his respirators. A modest staff of skilled workers produce almost every part of the devices including the plastics. Assembly of the varied bird devices is done by hand. The operation is efficient, and each employee is cross-trained to perform numerous jobs. One of Dominique Bird's many jobs is to bench test each unit prior to shipment. The most meaningful thing is the mothers on some of the babies that went home that might not have gone home otherwise have taken the time to write us. At Christmas time, or they sent us cards with pictures of their children maturing and so on. Now, some of them are mildly handicapped, but most of them are normal. And gosh, a mild handicap is better, I guess, than not having the child at all. But as we've gone on over the last 10 to 15 years, our learning curve is just tremendous. And now many of the 5 or 6% of the babies that we couldn't save with the baby bird come through with flying colors because we're able to handle them easier. And that's why it's so meaningful. It's fun. The birds are both avid pilots and frequently barnstorm the continent to visit clinics or give lectures. 
Fixed wing or rotor, you name it, and Forrest can fly it. In fact, he might already own it. The Bird Air Force presently stands at 14 aircraft strong. I guess my mental escape is, is my aviation. Uh, my daddy was a World War I pilot. At 14, I soloed. And that's what brought me into this, through the military and so on. So my life has been built around airplanes. And if I hadn't had the flexibility of my airplanes, I couldn't have been all over this world flying my own airplane with a bunch of respirators in the back. I could be in New York one day working at Bellevue Hospital. I could be working in L.A. County Hospital the next. And that, the airplanes gave me my freedom, but also it was a tremendous mental escape. You get up in the airplane and you look down and you got a massive problem and everything looks so obscure and so little down there, you realize how small your problems are. As a pilot in the Ferry Command in World War II, Bird flew a wide variety of Allied and enemy aircraft. The altitude of the American planes was limited by an oxygen delivery system that didn't work too well above 28,000 feet. I brought a captured uh, German airplane back across the North Atlantic into Wright-Patterson. I discovered they had some, what I thought was unique oxygen breathing equipment, and it was what we now call demand equipment. It had a larger tube that would come up instead of a very small tube, and you had a larger mask and so on on. And your effort, your inspiratory effort, as you would come in, would move a diaphragm and it would release oxygen automatically to you. And I thought this was quite an improvement. However, you had to pull real hard to release it. I figured, well, I could certainly improve upon that. Bird's improvements were well received by the Army Air Corps. He continued to work on aviation breathing devices, studying their physiological effects, as well as their physics. He was encouraged to study medicine, after which the full potential of his work was realized. The young pilot looking for a way to fly higher had invented a replacement for the iron lung. I think we don't have limits. We often have our own self-imposed limits. But quite often you resolve one problem and it opens up a whole myriad of avenues and you can start a lifetime of going out in these different tangents that are fruitful. At 70 years old, Forest Bird has witnessed aviation advance from biplanes to jets. Medicine advanced from sulfur drugs to CAT scans. He's concerned that innovation in this country is being impaired by overregulation and litigation to the point of peril. A young Forest Bird couldn't do things the way he did, but that shouldn't stop him from trying. So many people will get up just to the point of fruition when something's going to bloom, and they leave it. They procrastinate. You see that everywhere, in every single thing. And I think one thing that bothers a lot of people is they get an idea and they think it's the only idea they're going to have. Most people have millions and billions of ideas. But when you have one that you think is unique, follow it through. And especially then you get in so that you get conditioned to an area. And the longer you condition to an area, the greater your deductive and inductive base. Now, the, it's the inductive base, the experimental base that you build up in a certain field that allows you to excel and move ahead. And it's your failures that, you, that you've made and you know, well, maybe this didn't work, but part of it worked. And then we find another part and we put the two together and they work. This approach takes time, but it brings success and the opportunity to serve. We don't want to serve each other as servants, but we want to serve each other uniquely with our own abilities. And when you have developed a unique ability that maybe everyone doesn't possess, it's like, gosh, I look at somebody play the piano and I wish to God I could do it. It's something unique they have. Well, for some reason, God's gift to me, I can develop certain devices. And among these devices, of course, are devices to maintain life. And it's been a thrill. If you have a topic for Northwest Profiles, send it to KSPS-TV, South 3911 Regal, Spokane, Washington, 99223. Northwest Profiles is a presentation of KSPS-TV.